Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm Richard Dearden. I'm a second year PhD student at Imperial College London, so I'm just going to set the time here. And um, so I'm working on the very early evolution of the cartilaginous fishes, which is the modern, the group that includes the living sharks and rays. In particular, I'm looking at this group called the spiny sharks, the Lacandodians, a fine example of which you can see here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about one of the kind of side projects that makes up my PhD. Uh, before I crack on with the dead fish, I'd like to thank these various people, the, uh, my lovelies and my collaborators, and Steve Walsh, the National Museum of Scotland, has been really, really helpful with access to specimens. So, what is an early vertebrate? One of the Akandadian is an early vertebrate, and why do we care? So, the vertebrates today, we've got the nathostomes, the jawed vertebrates, and the cyclostomes, the jawless vertebrates. And the nathostomes have gone kind of mental in comparison to the cyclostomes. They're way more diverse, they're inhabiting loads more ecologies, and they build all this on a kind of suite of morphological innovations that you just get in the nathostomes, uh, like bone and teeth and jaws and paired fins and that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, living groups aren't all that informative in kind of helping us out work out what happened in this kind of really interesting evolutionary event. Because uh, this node here is at least 423 million years ago, and probably quite a lot older. So to work out what's going on, we have to turn to the fossil record, which provides us with the morphologies of all these extinct fishes from the uh, Paleozoic period. Uh, these kind of chronicle on the methostone stem, the acquisition of bone with the heterostrochins, um, paired fins with the osteostrochins, and then the placoderms, which Mark is talking about later, uh, finally get yours. Um, but rather than these guys, I'm actually going to be talking about the very earliest parts of this crown group um, with my acanthodians. So, living nathostomes are divided into two groups, the bony fishes, which is more or less any fish you can think of, and you guys, tetrapods, are all bony fishes, and then the cartilaginous fishes, which are a bit more troublesome, um, as you'll see, which include sharks, rays, and the really weird rat, rabbit and elephant fishes, the chimeras. And as you guess from the name, these are mostly distinguished by their skeletons, that's kind of the most charismatic difference. Bony fishes have a bony internal skeleton and big dermal plates that kind of uh, line the outside, Whereas the cartilaginous fishes have a cartilage uh, endoskeleton and lots of tiny little denticles on the outside. If you think about stroking a goldfish, uh, it's kind of like sandpaper, that's what those are. Um, and so we're going to be looking at, we, so we're trying to work out what's going on in the very earliest part of this ground's evolution. And one of the groups that's pivotal to understanding this is the Acanthodians, uh, these guys, which sit somewhere around here and are probably some of the earliest members of this crown group. So what's an Acanthodian? Uh, this group of rather underwhelming fish-shaped splats are Acanthodians. Um, so we used to know them mainly from Europe. More recently, and they were kind of partitioned into traditional groups and treated as a group because they all had these spines. Um, more recently, we found more in Canada over the last like, 20 years or so in this place called the Moth Locality. And they're really cool. They've got these really interesting characteristics, which leads us into one of the most interesting things about Acanthodians is they've kind of got this hotchpotch of bony fish and cartilaginous fish characters which makes it very confusing, while at the same time potentially very informative if we can work out what they are in telling us how characters have changed in this early part of nathostone evolution. So when they go, people have put them in several different places. They put them with the bony fishes, they put them with the cartilaginous fishes, and they put them on this stem. Um, this argument has been going on in various ways for about 200 years. Um, in the last 20 years, however, there's been kind of a, these Canadian acanthodians I mentioned have kind of uh, relaunched interest in the, these fishes. Uh, and also the description of brain cases. So brain cases are this really useful source of phylogenetic characters because uh, you can compare them across loads of disparate groups. Um, so Acanthodes, this guy, this filter feeling kind of enormous looking Acanthodian here, uh, is what we know most Acanthodian endoskeletons from. But we've also got Tobacanthus, which is a guy that was described a lot more recently. Um, so these made it look like the Acanthodians probably aren't even a group. They're probably just like splatted over some combination of these three uh, branches. Even more recently, uh, people have worked out that probably these placoderms, dermal plates, they've got big dermal plates, are probably the same as obviously eating big dermal plates. So the fact that acanthodians have these tiny little shark like scales, which I forgot to mention earlier, but should have done, means that they go onto the chondrichthian stem here. And they're probably uh, like a paraphyletic group that kind of chronicles the early acquisition of chondrichthian characters. So, we're, but we do struggle for characters a bit. As you saw, they're a bit rubbish. So we need more morphological characters that we can harvest from these acanthodians and use to plug into phylogenetic analyses and work out what's going on. So, um, yeah, sorry, they've been pushed onto this stem. One place we can look for this, which I'll be talking about today, is the gill arches. So what's a gill arch? As this, this Baskin shark is showing off, it's magnificent gill arches. They've kind of seen it with bony or cartilaginous struts that support their branchial basket. Uh, so they're obviously used for respiration, but they're also used for feeding. Often they have gill rakers on. 
Uh, if there's any branchial arch or fictionados out there, you might have noticed that there's a really nice bluefin tuna down in the museum where you can see all these gill makers on an articulated gills garden, which I thought was cool, but I guess I'm a bit lame. Um, so, gill arches have long been recognised as a character that can be used for kind of working out what's going on in here. There are big differences between bony fish gill arches and cartilaginous fish gill arches. So, bony fish gill arches, they're made of these four elements. So, you've got this basal thing, which is kind of in the middle. This is the thing we've taken the gill skeleton, and we've kind of peeled it outwards. Uh, so, we've got these are the top elements up here, bottom elements, and this is the front uh, where these arrows are pointing. So, there are four elements, this kind of V in the middle, the blue and yellow thing, and then the top and bottom elements are both pointing forward in this kind of V shape. Chondrichians, on the other hand, if you look at this, They've still got this V in the middle, but then the top and bottom elements are both pointing backwards, and they've got a single shape that I can't do without breaking my arms. Um, and this has long been viewed as a distinction, but we don't really know what's going on in this bit down here. For a long time, the only source of information we had was Acanthodes, this gormless Acanthodes that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but it's kind of it's this filter feeder, and it's really derived, and it's one of the latest occurring Acanthodes, so it's a bit of a rubbish source. And to make it worse, we don't really know what's going on at the top. It looks like its bottom elements are pointing forward, but up here, who knows? So we need more information on this, basically. Uh, recently, the shark was described, which looked like it had uh, osteoctin-like gill arches. So maybe this makes it seem as if the osteoctin thing is the primitive condition, and we can use this to diagnose things that definitely belong on a convicting stem. So if you find something with a posterior pointing stuff, it's definitely convicting. So enter Diplocanthus. Uh, I actually brought my, by coincidence, I had my fishy friend right here. Um, but I will show you a big picture of him, because he's quite far away. So Diplocanthus sits down here, it's probably more closely related to Acanthodes. Uh, remember we said Acanthodes aren't really a proper group, so they're kind of spread along this stem. Uh, so he's not more closely related to Acanthodes, this gormous one, than these sharky Acanthodes. But he is far more early than Diplocanthus, uh, sorry, than uh, Acanthodes. So this is Diplocanthus in all his fishy glory. Uh, to orient you, this is a picture of him. So we've got up here dorsal fin, dorsal, oops, dorsal fin, dorsal fin. Uh, pectoral fin, this is kind of a face, uh, lower jaw, upper jaw, and the gill arches that we're interested in are here. So, we synchrotron scanned it, and it revealed that um, I can, the Diplocanthus was replete with endoskeletal goodies that we could have a look at. Uh, so, this is the synchrotron scan overlaid. Uh, so, just if I can spin it around, uh, so I'm sure you don't need this explaining, it's easy to work out where everything is, right? Um, but I'll go through it anyway. So, this is the dorsal fin here, the vertical <coughs> column is going back here, pectoral fin, uh, brain cases up here. These are the jaws wide open, so this is the bottom and this is the top. And these are the gill arches, so this is what we're interested in. So, to get to the chase, the branchial skeleton of Diplocanthus, what's it like? Can we use it as a useful comparative source of information to work out what's going on on this convicting stem? So, if we look at them, so it's very, very squashed, as you can see. Um, these are these lower elements here, these blue ones, and these are the yellow ones and the forward pointing elements in the middle. And then we've got one of these top elements and some of these bottom elements in green here. And just to remind you, this is what, okay, what bony and cartilaginous fishes look like. So we've got this, it's like a V in the middle, like both of them. The bottom elements are pointing forward, like in Acanthodes and like in bony fishes. But the top element looks like it's probably pointing backwards. This is the only one I can find, but I think he's pointing backwards. Uh, so it looks like it has this hotchpotch condition between bony and cartilaginous fishes. Uh, so what's this mean for our kind of big overview? Um, so, as we said, Diplocanthus probably lives with Acanthodes here. So if we whack it on, it looks like probably um, the situation with this, this being the earliest kind of, this what primitive gill arches look like is probably incorrect. Like this guy's probably actually quite derived, and they say he's like an early convictium, but he's probably actually is more closely related to their elephant fishes and stuff, which are really, really weird, than he is to their uh, last banks, the sharks and things. Uh, so it looks like maybe down here we have this kind of hot pot of chondrichium-like characters, this posterior directly gill arch, and osteoclean characters. So it looks like maybe we can use this posterior directed gill arch as a way to diagnose things that belong on the convicting stem. Uh, so I concentrated on gill arches today, but there's a few more like ways we can mine Diplocanthus for information for, to work out what's going on. Um, so we can look at the brain case. The brain case is currently an absolutely horrible splat that I can't interpret, but I am still segmenting this. Uh, if anyone has any great ideas about what bit is what, please feel free to let me know. Uh, this is probably the orbit, I've got about this far. Uh, this is a dermal uh, plate kind of lying on top. But then after that, it's anyone's guess, it's kind of smushed across. But if I can work out what's going on, then it'll be a really big source of information. Secondly, the reason this diplocanthus, remember we said we had almost no endoskeletal information on Acanthodians. The reason this guy is so good is because his whole skeleton is bony. And bizarrely for Acanthodians, 
um, very, most of which are cartilaginous endoskeletons, and even weirder, he's from this quarry where there's loads of the same species of uh, animal, and none of them are bony. It's only this guy. He's like this weird, bony, like a bony freak. But if we, this is the synchrotron, one of the tomographs, and you can see there's kind of mineralization inside. Uh, we're going to try and synchrotron scan this, but if it is, is mineralization inside, it'll be the first uh, view of it outside osteopians, which might force us to rethink our ideas of how bone evolved in vertebrates a little bit. Uh, and one final thing, there's lots of boring characters that I didn't go into. Well, I mean, maybe you think when I talk about boring characters. Even more boring characters. Uh, comparing it to other acanthodians, this is acanthodes. Um, so you can see the, there's characters that we can use, like there's a foramen up here and up here, which they share, which probably unites them to the exclusion of other acanthodians, but that's a bit dull. Um, so basically, we've got this fish. Um, we've got gill arches, which are really far genetically informative. Um, and it, it kind of gives us an insight into this early evolution. I'm hoping to harvest characters from this and plug it into a phylogenetic analysis to compare it to other early vertebrates. Uh, so that's it. Thank you.